Good morning, everybody. That was terrible. Good morning, everybody. It is, in fact, a good morning. Uh, I appreciate Eric prophesying spring into existence. Yes, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus, or spring, um, either one. Uh, yeah, my name's Adam, uh, and I, I, I am who uh, Pastor Justin said I am. So excited to see all of you today, so encouraged to come back. I love coming here in these like four to six week intervals, because every time I come back, something in this building is more beautiful, and there are more of you, and uh, this, is, this is great. So uh, I'm super encouraged about what God is doing in this house. I hope you're encouraged, um, and if you're, if you're new to Aletheia, and you're like, man, I'm just checking out church or checking out Christianity, then I hope you'll stick around for, for uh, a few weeks and, and give... Uh, give a look at what God is doing in this place because it's really, really remarkable. I'm a, uh, what's the right word for it? Nerd. Um, and, uh, and so I study church uh, too much, probably. My, my wife tells me that uh, if I don't get done with my PhD before our youngest or our oldest child goes into college, that she'll <clears throat> put a pillow over my face in my sleep. So uh, so what that means is I, I nerd out about like church planting and how churches grow and also you know a lot of Bible stuff too and and what God has done in this place I can't tell you how how statistically unlikely it is for this thing to happen and then all the things that have happened since this church has been planted so I'm just I'm super encouraged about what God has done and very very full of faith about what He will do. Um, now, if you have a Bible, open it to the book of Joel. Um, if you don't know where Joel is, open your Bible first to the book of Table of Contents and locate Joel. Uh, it's, a, it's a short little book, and uh, it's, it's a book that is almost entirely unrelatable on the surface. Right? Maybe some of you heard, we're going to do Joel, and you were like, oh, is Joel in the Bible? That's probably maybe where, where you were. Joel is a, it's a short little book. It's just three chapters long, and, and Joel is a super interesting prophet, as you guys probably heard last week. Joel is showing up, we think, after the exile, but we can't be totally sure, and, and he's just a guy. He's just a guy named Joel. His dad's name is Pethuel, and that's all we know. Um, he's not super special. He wasn't a king. He wasn't in any sort of connectivity to the, to the temple or to the priest. He's just someone that the Holy Spirit came upon to bring truth to his people. And last week we learned, okay, if, if this guy, Joel, loves people enough to tell them the truth, then we must love people enough to do the same. We've got to love people enough to do the same. And so we looked at the first part of this book, and the first part of this book is not great. It's not great. Joel is basically prophesying to Israel, Israel, the pain that you're in is because of the sins that you've committed. And the day of the Lord that is coming like a freight train to you is looking real bad because of the sins you might still commit. You need to repent. And he, he offers us these two like parallel poems, and the, both of them end with Repentance. And the last one ended with this really beautiful, uh, beautiful phrase, rend your heart and not your garments. C- come to me with, with repentance. That's a re- I don't know if you know this, but like in, um, in the Middle East, even still today in some cultures, but especially back then, when, you're, when you were uh, grieving, when you were mourning, or when something terrible had happened to you, you would tear your garment. I don't know if you ever heard the sound of a tearing garment, but this would be the outward sign of, you know, I'm, I'm feeling guilt, I'm feeling shame, or something really bad has happened to me. And what God is saying through his prophet is like, look, that's fine if you do that, but I'm really looking for your heart to be broken over what, what you've done. So that's kind of a bummer, kind of a minor chord upon which to end last week's sermon. And today, it turns into a very different tone turns into a very different tone, a tone full of grace. And so uh, let's jump in at Joel 2.18, and we'll read through the rest of this chapter. Then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I am sending to you grain, wine, and oil, and you will be satisfied. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you. And drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea and his rear guard into the western sea, and the stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beasts of the field, for pastures of the wilderness are green, the tree bears its fruit, the fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. 
For he has given the early rain for your vindication, and he has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and the latter rain as before. The threshing floor shall be full of grain, and the vat shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and you shall praise the name of the Lord your God who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else, and my people shall never again be put to shame. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit, and I'll show wonders in the heavens on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem, there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said. And among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? God, this is a text that's hard to relate to. Sometimes the gold is right there on the surface for us to pick. And Lord, sometimes in your word, it requires some digging And so, Lord, would you help me today preach this text faithfully? Would you give ears to hear and eyes to see to my friends here today? And, Lord, would you show us how you want to work in us to be messengers of grace in the same way you worked through Joel to be a messenger of grace? In Jesus' name, amen. So as I was saying, the reason we're doing this series um, is not just so that we can learn about what Joel had to say, but we're, we're like three or four weeks away from the international easiest day to invite anyone to church and tell anyone about Jesus Day. Uh, we call that day Easter, right? And, and so as, as a team, we were thinking like, okay, how can we encourage our people to do what the scriptures say, to be bold enough to tell people truth and loving enough to show them grace? To, to live out this call to make disciples, not just by finding some mediocre Christians and making them slightly less mediocre, but by coming to our neighbors who might not know Jesus at all, might think Christians are crazy, and tell them the truth of God's word, extend to them grace. How do we actually do this well, leading up to the international easiest day to invite anyone to church and tell anyone about Jesus? Easter's a little easier, rolls off the tongue. So we want to encourage you. We don't just want to look at what Joel did, but we want to say, okay, what can we learn from what Joel did? Because if Joel was a random person that the Holy Spirit came upon to do something great, wait a minute, we're all random people (laughs) that the Holy Spirit can come upon so that we might be a part of doing something great for God, right? And so today, I have a simple, simple, simple admonition for you, is that God wants to make you a messenger of grace. God wants to make you a messenger of grace. Uh-huh. Yes, you, even you. Now, right now in your head, if you're anything like me, you're going, okay, but uh, I can't do that. And the reason that I can't do that, and then you have a number of reasons. Uh, the Christian sounding reason would be something like, uh, this is a season where I'm just working on myself, brother, um, uh, which is just Bible ease and still an excuse. So don't do that. And some of you, it's, it's a fear. Like, I want to be liked. We all want to be liked by people, right? We don't want to be rejected unless you're a sociopath, in which case, pray with us after this. <laughs> but m- most of all, it's, it's this sense that, like, talking to people about Jesus and extending grace and mercy and being outward-oriented with my faith is the job of someone like the pastor or like the super volunteer, but, like, not me. And I have to encourage you, yes, you. You, right where you are, you with your problems, you with whatever's going on in your life, God wants to make you, not some future more perfect version of you, you right now, he wants to make you a messenger of grace. Because here's the crazy thing about following Jesus. It's only by doing the things that Jesus asks us to do that we become more like the person Jesus wants us to be. It's not, it doesn't work in the reverse. It doesn't, we don't just become more like the person Jesus wants us to be and then start doing the things Jesus wants us to do. It feels like that should be the way, but it's not. Following Jesus is not like going to school. 
It's like going to school and you, okay, sit in school and then we'll give you a degree and then you can go to your job. Following Jesus is far more like becoming an electrician. You apprentice yourself to someone a little further down the road, but you are messing with wires on day one until you can be trusted to do this yourself. It's far more like apprenticeship than it is like being a student. And so let's let Joel apprentice us for just a minute and show us how God wants to make us a messenger of grace. First, we're going to look at how Joel became a messenger of grace. He, he speaks about the grace of God in three really distinct and interesting ways that I want to show you. The first way he talks about God's grace is this grace of, of his mercy, of his mercy towards sinners. He says this in verse 18, then the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The word jealous is an okay translation. It can also mean just like passionate. He's super passionate about his promises and about his people. That should really encourage you. God is not ambivalent toward you. He's not like passive toward you. He is passionate about you. He is jealous for you to walk in the things that he wants you to walk in. So his passion motivated his pity. The Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I'm sending you grain, wine, and oil, and you'll be satisfied. And I won't make you a reproach among the nations. I'll remove the northerner. That's not just because God doesn't like northerners. That would be very bad news for all of us here. <laughs> That's, the north was the, the place from which invaders came to carry off Israel and then Judah. And so Joel's looking at them, and you've probably remember from last week, locusts were a very prominent character in last week. He compares northern uh, aggression from Assyria and Babylon as like a locust plague. He's saying, I'm going to drive the enemy from you. He he tells them that God's going to come around, the judgment and discipline of God is going to end when they repent and he's going to come and he's going to forgive them. He's going to push back the enemy from them. Some of you right now, you feel so dogged by life. I mean, it literally is like, I think Satan knows my address. Like, I think he just likes to hang out in my house. And, uh, and, and I, I get that. There's something beautiful here that God has to say to you, just like God had to say to them, that, that part of the grace of God is the grace of his mercy and the grace of his forgiveness. And that was part of the way Joel wanted to talk to the people of Israel. Let's look at the second way. He goes on to say, Fear not, land, rejoice. The Lord has done great things. Be glad, children of Zion. He's given you early rain. I'll restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and you'll eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God. Not only is the grace of God's forgiveness coming to Israel, but the grace of his restoration or provision, his blessing. The grace that that comes and actually fixes the thing that your sin broke, right? So so he just prophesied a chapter ago that their sin meant their land was destroyed, right? And so if you just come back from being exiled into a foreign country and you'd only been back a little bit and someone began to prophesy that God's grace was going to come not just to forgive you, but actually to restore the desolate, horrible, fruitless war zone that your home looks like, that would be really good news, wouldn't it? That would be really good news, that that God, in response to our repentance, is not just going to forgive us, but he's actually going to bless us. God likes you. Can can I tell you that? Sometimes we get God's will and God's uh, mood a little bit shifted, okay? So we think that God's will is to always bless us and make us, you know, healthy, wealthy, and wise, that's not always his will, just like it's not always the will of a good parent to, to do that with your children. You'll, you'll spoil them, right? And sometimes you have to withhold the material blessings so that you can help your kid become the kind of person who should be blessed, right? Please, dear goodness, on, on Parenting Sunday, tell me like, oh, yes, okay, all right? <laughs> While his will isn't always only ever to bless us and make us healthy, wealthy, and wise, his disposition toward us is always blessing. It's always mercy. It's always kindness. It's always generosity of spirit. It's always love. That's his mood toward his people. You got that? That in Christ, that is his mood toward you. I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but this is what Joel is prophesying to Israel, that when God forgives you, he's not just going to forgive your sin, but he's going to bless you. He's going to restore whatever the devourer took. He's going to give it back. That's a heck of a promise. 
That's a heck of a promise, especially if you'd been victimized by these terrible people, which says one other thing. He's not just going to restore the material blessings, but there's something about restoration in justice itself. Right? One, one way to think about injustice is the taking of peace, the taking of, of uh, righteousness, the taking of shalom from someone. And when God comes to make the world right again, he comes to restore justice. So no longer would injustice mark their land, but justice and righteousness would. And the third way that he talks about grace is the grace of his own presence. Look at this. Verse 28 says, it will come to pass afterwards, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see vision. What's he saying? Everybody is going to experience the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. Everybody is going to experience me, is what God is saying. Now, that maybe sounds you know, very common to you, because maybe you've been in church before, but in Ancient Israel, before the coming of Christ, the presence of God was located in one place on the earth. It was inside the Holy of Holies, in the temple, and that was it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit would like rush upon somebody, like in the book of Judges, but nobody would ever talk about God being present with them as they went about their daily lives. That was not the way anybody thought. It would have been rather presumptuous to have thought of yourself that way. But here, Joel is prophesying something crazy that the very spirit and presence of God is no longer going to be located inside of a temple. It's going to be located inside of people. And not just like special people or rich people or royal people, all the people. The young people, the old people, the male and female people, the societally high, the societal... Everybody is going to experience the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. And that is a grace to you, my friends. That is a grace that Joel is prophesying that when forgiveness comes, when mercy comes, when grace comes, there's redemption for sin... There's restoration of blessing, and then there's the reception of God's presence in your life. Some of you, this is a different sermon, but I'm going to preach a small sermon inside my big sermon here. Some of you have only captured this first thing Jesus gave you. Like the only thing you know about grace is, great, now I don't go to hell. And while that is great, there is so much more of grace for you to walk in. It's not just like, okay, I repented of my sins, and now I get to go to heaven forever. It's okay, now I get God. Like in my life, I get the Holy Spirit speaking to me, illuminating the words of the gospel, changing my character to become more and more like Jesus, blessing the endeavors of my hands. I get God in my life. There's a whole lot more of God for you to walk with. There's a whole lot more of the presence and power of the Holy Spirit for you to walk in. Little sermon over, back to the big one. God wants to make you a messenger of grace. And this is how Joel was a messenger of grace. Now, the crazy and awesome thing about being a follower of Jesus, if that describes you today, is that every single thing Joel prophesied, we look back on as fulfilled history. Every single thing that Joel prophesied, we look back upon and we can see when and where it happened. Joel prophesied the grace of redemption and forgiveness. Jesus comes to bear the penalty for our sins so that we might be forgiven, so that he might grant us his righteousness. Joel prophesied the grace and mercy of restoration. Jesus comes to give us literal mansions in the sky, promising that if we ask anything in his name, he will give it to us, that we can walk in the abundance of his presence. That's crazy. And, And most of all, Jesus fulfills this promise of God's presence. Not only was Jesus the literal like embodied presence of God, he's the content of prophecy put flesh upon, but he says, All right, it's actually better that I go so that I'm not just walking around with like 12 of you, but so that the Spirit of God might fill all of you. And so Jesus returns to his Father. The Holy Spirit fills the church. And when that happens, do you know, do you know what happened? Peter gets up to preach this sermon right? Tongues of fire has happened. Like, it's crazy Pentecost day. I mean, it, it, was, it, was a, it was a crazy day. And people are like, what is going on? And Peter said, oh, don't you remember? And you can find this in Acts chapter 2. Joel prophesied this. He said, don't you remember? Joel said that the Holy Spirit would come upon people and they'd prophesy and they'd dream dreams. But I don't know if you know this. Peter changed one word of what Joel prophesied. We read, it shall come to pass afterwards. 
that God will do all these wonderful things. That's what Joel said. But Peter said, and it shall be in the last days. He changed it, the word afterward, to the word last days. Why, why did he do that? He, he did that because the gift of the Holy Spirit connects us in a way to the coming day of the Lord. It's literally like God's promised future is rushing backwards into our moment right now, that the kingdom of God is rushing downward into our moment right now by the power of the Holy Spirit so that we can be and become messengers of grace. That's crazy to me. People say, do you, do you believe that we're in the latter days? Yep, every day we're one day closer. It's been the latter days for a long time. I don't know how long we'll be there. But here, we get this crazy set of promises from Joel that Jesus Christ himself fulfills. Now, if we were just doing a sermon on Joel, this is where we'd stop and we'd you know, thank God and respond. But we're, we're doing something one level deeper here. We're going, okay, if that's what Joel said, and that's what... Jesus did to accomplish what Joel said, because Jesus is our greater and more perfect prophet. How do we, given that Jesus has come and the Holy Spirit has been poured out and all that stuff that Joel prophesied has more or less happened, how do we become messengers of grace like Joel was? We've got to talk about the mercy of God. We've got to talk about the mercy of God. And I'm not just talking about talk about the mercy of God, okay? Or talk about the mercy of God. I'm sure you're, you know, Christian coffee mug and your you know, fish sticker on the back of your car and you know, the oddly placed Bible verse on your Facebook wall or whatever is enormously powerful. Um, I, I've yet to meet someone in church who, uh, when I say, oh, cool, how'd you come to Jesus? And they, well, I, I hated God and Christians, but then I saw something on Facebook. And uh, yeah, and my heart was strangely warmed. And I, I don't know anyone that, that, for whom that has happened. We actually have to speak We've got to proclaim this grace. So let's think about these three ways. Proclaiming, talking about the mercy of God, or the grace of God, we must first talk about the grace of his forgiveness and his mercy, just like Joel did. We have to tell people, look, your sins are messing up your life and will forever if you don't repent, but I have good news for you. If you do, God would love to forgive you. That is what he is like. He delights to forgive your sin. He doesn't delight to punish the wicked. The Bible says that very clearly. His heart is gracious. Jesus has been generous with his mercy so that if you come to him, you can be forgiven. We got to tell people that. You have no idea how often I hear someone say, I just felt so ashamed and like God's mercy wasn't big enough for me. I don't know all of your situation. I don't know your past. I don't know what you've done. I don't know what's making you feel extremely guilty and shameful. But the, the lie of the enemy is that whatever you've done, you better, not, you better not try to bring that to church. You better fix that before you get there. Whatever you've done, you got, God, I'm going to forgive that. Your sin is extra gross. That's such a lie. That is such a lie. But you've got friends. This is why Brene Brown sells so many books. She's written the same book like 10 times. And the book is, You Shouldn't Be Marked by Your Shame. That's the book. That's her whole message. Every TED Talk is just shame, 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 shame. You've probably read some of these, and you're like, oh, I shouldn't feel shame. But the real answer to shame isn't positive self-talk. The real answer to shame is the mercy and grace of King Jesus. Because when God says you're forgiven and no longer marked by your shame, who cares what anybody else says? When God announces that you're forgiven, your own self-talk will come along, my friends. But if we just kind of lie to ourselves, like, oh, I'm a good person, when in reality we've not received the mercy and grace of Jesus, then we're not messengers of grace because we haven't received it. The second way I believe we can become messengers of grace from this text is to proclaim the restoration and the blessing of God. The restoration and the blessing of God, that when we follow Jesus, there is an abundance that we are now able to walk in. We step into a community of the most generous group of people ever to have existed, which is true, by the way. By a long shot, followers of Jesus are the most generous group of people that have ever existed, ever. So now we get to step into the most generous community. We get to become a part of the most generous community that will hopefully make us even more generous, not only toward God, but toward each other. And because of God's promise, there's going to be a blessing upon our work, a blessing upon the things that he calls us to do. That's amazing stuff. 
That is absolutely amazing stuff. Some of you know that blessing. Some of you are like, I do not deserve to be as prosperous or successful as I am. I can see the hand of God there and that crazy deal here and that thing that shouldn't have happened there. You can see in your past the mercy of God. Don't you think someone else needs to hear about that? How many people go to bed at night with their anxiety level at a 9 out of 10 because they're just not sure if the deal's going to go through the next day or if the boss is going to see their work or if they're going to make their promotion or if they're going to make their payments or whatever, and that anxiety eats them up from the inside. When you become a follower of Jesus, you are promised, hey, look at the birds of the air. God takes care of them. Look at the flowers of the field. They're prettier than you. Well, if God treats them like that, how much more? Will he take care of you? That is something that your friends and your neighbors and your colleagues need to hear. And third and finally, we can proclaim the grace of his presence. The grace of his presence. I, don't, I haven't looked at what um, stats are like here, but where I minister, I find it very odd that the most common psychological emotional issue that seems to come up over and over again is this intense sense of loneliness <laughs> in a city where people are packed very closely it's like the closer you push them together the more their loneliness increases i don't know why that is how amazing is the promise that when you receive the mercy of god god never ever leaves you that even in your loneliest moment God is with you. That even in your darkest moment, when you feel misunderstood by the world, when your spouse is not getting you, when your kids don't understand you, when your friends are like, what's wrong with her? God is always with you. Now, some of you are like, well, that just sounds like, you know, okay, like a myth you tell yourself. Listen, no, because I, in my natural self, am not even closely inclined to tell myself such nonsensical myths. I'm naturally a pessimist, a pessimist, a pessimist. So anything like faith that exists in my life is, in, is a work of the Holy Spirit. But I can tell you, having walked through darkness that I really did not want to walk through, even while I was complaining at God and even while I was doing the whole, like, Lord, what is going on? He's always been there. Wouldn't it be amazing if a group of people in Providence, Rhode Island, were able to not just invite their friends to church, which please do that, but able also to say, to proclaim the message of, man, God, God has mercy for that. God has grace for that. God can restore that. God can forgive that. God can bless that. God wants to actually walk closely with you. What if we began to be the kind of people who were generous with the message of the gospel, like God has been generous to us? Not so motivated by fear that, you know, I... I I don't want to come off as any kind of way. Look, if you're a Christian, you already are annoying to people. I'm sorry. And you're definitely not cool, right? You're just not. And some of you are like, I'm pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> it's so much better to receive the smile and approval of God than to clamor for the smile and approval of people. We can be messengers of God's grace because, and we'll end with this promise, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Everyone who calls, that's pretty amazing that everyone, everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friends, this place needs Jesus. And post-pandemic and post-economic whatever and post-everything that's happened over the last year and a half or two, I don't think we've, in our generation, been more in touch with our vulnerability, with our shame, with the injustice of our world, with the flimsy nature of bodily health, all the things that we trust in. We've just seen how they're just like a candy coating on a really dark reality. People need to hear, and you can be, you can be a messenger of grace where you are. So what I want to do, I want to pray for you, and I want to pray for two things. First, I want to pray for those of you who are in here and maybe like, I never heard that message. Awesome. I'm glad you're here. Today can be the day that you actually turn away from sin and trust in Jesus. And there are some of you in here that are maybe just like need some kind of push or encouragement to, to talk about Jesus. So I'd, I'd like to pray for both of you 
kinds of persons right now because God wants to make us these messengers of grace. So Lord, would you do that? Father, I pray first for my friends in here who are followers of Jesus, but Lord, they, uh, we feel um, worried, we feel disinclined very often to talk about the grace and mercy of the gospel because we're worried about how we will come off. Oh God, forgive us for our fear and our lack of faith. Lord, would you fill us with faith? Lord, my friends in here who have friends and family and colleagues whose lives are falling apart. God, I pray that you would give them opportunity to speak to them. In fact, where you are right now, I'd love for you to just take 30 seconds, if you're comfortable doing this, pray, pray, praying on your own for the people that you know that deeply need the message of grace. The people in your life that you know are rocked with depression, fear, anxiety, loneliness, Oh, Lord, use us, please, to bring the message of gospel grace. And finally, I want to pray for those of you in here who maybe aren't yet followers of Jesus, and you just heard this, and you're like, man, I want, to, I want to know more about that. If that's you, just pray this with me. God, I want to know you. I want to know this grace and mercy. I want to know what it's like to follow you. I want to understand more of your grace Would you help me now? In Jesus' name, amen. Can I ask you guys to stand?